Hey everybody, this is Pastor Jimmy and uh, first of all, let me say I'm really glad that uh, you're in a small group and that you're going to be a part of this study. And so we're about to embark on a journey together that's going to last several weeks that uh, we've entitled the study is Challenges to Christianity. As we look at some false teaching within the church, some pseudo-Christian religions, uh, some you know, non-Christian religions as some challenges to Christianity that are just completely outside the church to try to understand what they're teaching, to try to understand what the truth uh, really is, to be grounded in, in our beliefs, to know the difference between uh, the counterfeit and uh, the, the real. And uh, you've probably heard this illustration before, but of course one of the primary ways to do that is to know what the real looks like. Like there was a man at a church in Maryland who worked uh, uh, for the, depart the, the Treasury Department and you know the way they teach people in the Treasury Department or FBI agents or different people to detect counterfeit money is by so thoroughly familiarizing them with the a real thing that they can detect any deviation from that. So that's part of my goal with this is that we'd be so thoroughly grounded in the basic biblical truths of Christianity that we could spot any deviation from that and that in a kind and loving way be able to share Jesus, to share our faith with other people. Now, I know sometimes, you know, I like to use the saying, you fall in the ditch on either side of the road. And, and this is one of these subjects that this is true with. Some people fall in the ditch on the side of the road of being like heresy hunters and trying to find every little uh, deviation and going overboard and making secondary issues primary issues. And that is certainly something that we don't want to do. In actuality, uh, I want to equip you to not do that, to understand the difference between secondary and primary doctrine. But on the other hand, some people have the mindset of more like, well, why can't we just all uh, get along? And, uh, you know, what's the big deal about truth? What's the big deal uh, about doctrine? We kind of all basically believe the same thing or, you know, different roads lead to the, the same place. And um, I think that's a ditch a a as well. What we believe is really important. Being grounded in the faith is really important. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. And I want to demonstrate that to you in this introductory section that's going to take us a couple of weeks uh, to cover. I want to show you some warnings against false teachers. I want to show you the importance of uh, sound doctrine. And uh, let me just kind of start just maybe with some real life illustrations to hopefully help you uh, think about this. I mean, why does this matter? Well, I mean, does it matter that most of one side of my family are Mormon? Is that the same thing as being a Christian, is that the same thing as being a part of true life? Of course, one of my dad's brothers who was a Mormon uh, professed faith in Christ here, but the way my family got into Mormonism was during a time uh, of trial. The Mormon church served them and other churches didn't. And so that's probably something for us to think about as well. But does it matter? Uh, I preached my grandmother's funeral in a Mormon church one time. And I, I, I believe that she was saved from my conversations with her and uh, just had gotten confused, didn't really you know, fully know what the Mormon church taught. But in that message, I quoted uh, Ephesians 2.8 about how we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. And the Mormon bishop stood up and basically added to that. Does, does that matter? Does it matter what we believe? I think it does. I don't think things that are different are the same. And I think we're uh, talking about matters of eternity, matters of heaven and, and, and hell. Uh, you, you know, all roads don't lead to the same place. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father uh, but by me. Is, is that really true? Uh, you know, that's inclusive because we're all invited to come to him, but it is exclusive in the sense that he is the only way. Think about this. One of the Micronesian pastors, Pastor Teo, said to us recently as we were talking about what the gospel uh, really is and, and, and what it isn't. And, of course, they come from a Roman Catholic background. And uh, he made this statement, uh, kind of caught me a little bit off guard, that he said, I wish I could sue the Catholic Church. And I'm like, why? And he talked about growing up on you know, their island uh, you know, in Micronesia and um, you know, being a part of the Catholic Church that around Easter each year, that part of the celebration 
is they would uh, have them, uh, you know, carry a, a cross, I guess following the example of Jesus and as part of the penance uh, for their sins. And as we've talked about the cross, and specifically what we're talking about is Jesus alone is sufficient to save. Looking back on that, that really bothers him that he spent most of his life thinking that we had to carry crosses and work our way to God instead of trusting in the one who carried a cross and was strapped to a cross and that his payment was sufficient for our sins. Does it matter if whether or not we believe that Jesus' death on the cross alone was enough? Or do we have to do religious things like carry crosses and other things in order to be made right with God? I think it matters. Think about my experience of almost chucking Christianity, basically, when I was a student at Carson Newman. And I thank God for the answer prayer and the miracle that he's working there and turning uh, that university back to a focus on biblical truth. But it wasn't that way when I was there. And it messed with my head. And I just think about sometimes, what if I had gone down that road? Of course, I believe we're kept by the power of God and the salvation if we really belong to Him. But, but I mean, just think about it on a human level and where I was. I was just really wrestling with whether or not I believed. And it was just, I'm just going to chuck this and kind of do my own thing. How would that have affected my life? How would it have affected my family? I mean, what if... And, and I don't know, you know, this, this is God's plan. And he certainly could have raised somebody else to do it, but all we can deal with is a human level. What if uh, there hadn't been a true life? How would that have affected your life in Honduras and other places? Does it matter what we believe? Does the truth matter? I, I believe it absolutely does. And I, I believe, believe personally there's nothing that is more important than the truth, that love and unity and faith and all these other things flow out of that. And so I hope that's kind of... Uh, uh, the root of all of this, the foundation that we can build on. So uh, with that said in the way of introduction, let, let's think about uh, some of the warnings that uh, Scripture gives us in regard to false teachers. Tim Challies has written this, Satan's greatest ambassadors are not pimps, politicians, or power brokers, but pastors. His priests do not peddle a different religion, but a deadly perversion of the true one. His troops do not make a full-out frontal assault, but work as agents, sneaking into the opposing army. Satan's tactics are studied, clever, predictable, effective. Therefore, we must always remain vigilant. And that's true. And so here are some biblical warnings that we need to heed in order to remain vigilant against false teaching, against satanic uh, deception. Number one, in Matthew 7, 15, Jesus warned us against false prophets who are uh, really wolves in sheep's clothing. So wolves are dangerous, but a wolf that looked like a sheep uh, would be even more dangerous. And, and, and remember, in, in the life of the church, Jesus is the chief shepherd. Pastors are under shepherds. As Christians, genuine Christians are all sheep, but then there's goats who are false believers. There's straying sheep, but then there's wolves who are uh, you know, heretics, false prophets who are trying to attack the sheep. It's the job of shepherds to try to bring straying sheep back on to the path, to help goats come to a true salvation, but to protect the church against wolves. And of course, you can't reason with wolves. You have to shoot wolves. So Paul also warned us against wolves in his uh, farewell address, so to speak, to the uh, elders of the church at Ephesus. He said this in Acts 20, 28 through 31. He said, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, uh, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day uh, with, with, with tears. And so here's some things he tells us in these verses. Elders are to guard their own spiritual condition first and foremost. Elders are to guard the flock. In other words, that's part of mine and Rusty and Roger and Preston's charge from God in regard uh, to true life. Um, that is part of the biblical calling uh, of an elder. 
It's the Holy Spirit who makes elders, overseers of the church. It is God's church purchased with the blood of Jesus that we are shepherding. It's not our church, it's His church. And it was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what makes this such an important and serious thing. It's the church of God paid for with the lifeblood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He also warns them, and we'll come back to this, but he warns them that savage wolves will come in from outside the church. And then he also warns them that false teachers will rise up from within the church to lead people to follow them instead of Jesus. So false, faithful shepherds are called to protect the sheep from all wolves, whether inside or outside the church, by teaching, training, equipping, warning, and guarding the sheep. Uh, John Stott uh, writes something that's very instructive, I think very helpful in, in, in regard to helping us understand what the Bible's talking about when it talks about wolves. He says, in the ancient Near East, wolves were the chief enemy of sheep. Hunting now singly, now in packs, they were a constant threat. Sheep were defenseless against them. Shepherds could not afford to relax their vigilance, nor can Christian pastors. Jesus himself warned of false prophets, wolves in sheep's clothing, he called them. So the shepherds of Christ's flock have a double duty, to feed the sheep by teaching the truth and to protect them from wolves by warning of error. As Paul puts it to Titus, elders must hold firm the sure word according to apostolic teaching so that they will be able both to, quote, give instruction in sound doctrine and also to confute those who contradict it, end quote. This emphasis is unpopular today. We are frequently told to always be positive in our teaching and never negative. Um, but those who say they this have either not read the New Testament or having read it, they disagree with it. For the Lord Jesus and his apostles refuted error themselves and urged us to do the same. One wonders if it is the neglect of this obligation, which is a major cause of today's theological confusion. If when false teaching arises, Christian leaders sit idly by and do nothing or turn tail and flee, they will earn the terrible epithet uh, hirelings who care nothing for Christ's flock. Uh, then too it will be said of believers, as it was of Israel, that they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for all the wild animals. So as your pastors here at True Life, we take this charge seriously. And, and that's part of really why we're doing uh, this study. Number three, Paul instructs us to handle accurately accurately handle God's Word and stay away from false teaching. Paul instructs us to accurately handle God's Word and stay away from false teaching. In 2 Timothy 2, he tells us to rightly divide the Word of Truth. And uh, he even names two false teachers by name in this passage. It says false teaching will sp spread like cancer, overthrow the faith uh, of some people. So uh, we are called first and foremost positively to accurately handle the God Word of God and then negatively to stay away from those, stay away from teaching which does not do that. Uh, four, Paul warns us against any teaching that is not according to Christ in Colossians uh, 2, 8 and, and, and 9. Jesus is the center of the, the faith, the ultimate test of all doctrine. And so uh, all true Christian doctrine will line up with the person and work of Christ. Number five, the Holy Spirit, speaking through the Apostle Paul, pronounces a curse upon those who distort uh, the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, accursed in, in this passage, Galatians 1, 6 through 10, uh, is uh, the Greek word anathema. And it literally means to pronounce eternal damnation upon uh, someone. And um, you know, the idea of distorting or perverting the gospel is to twist it into something that's different. Paul says there's only one gospel. And so we have to be faithful to teach that gospel and to reject any teaching that is not in accordance with the gospel. And then number six, the Apostle John, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, commands us to be spiritually discerning in 1 John 4, 1 through 6. In, in verse 1 there, he writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so uh, these are, are, are six 
uh, very basic but very direct, very pointed warnings against false teaching that, that we need to heed, that we need to obey, and that we need to watch what we intake, watch what we believe, watch what we allow uh, in our church. So, Second, and uh, I hope you're reading your material and, and you can follow along and then uh, there's going to be discussion we have in, in your groups. We have discussion questions at the end of each section. But uh, I want us to look at some characteristics of false teaching. And this comes from a, a blog, an article by uh, Tim Challies. And um, the, the material in your notes, I'm just kind of going to summarize right now. But, uh, you know, a lot of what is in your notes is actually just a direct quotation uh, from his article. And so he talks about seven types of false teachers that are in the church today. And I think this is a very helpful, very uh, practical overview of, um, of, of false teachers and, you know, what we need to be aware of. So uh, the, the first type of false teacher that he mentions is the heretic. And uh, Peter specifically warned us against this in his second, leader, uh, second letter, uh, sorry. But uh, basically a heretic is one who denies or reformulates, uh, teaches in a different way, a basic fundamental doctrine of uh, the, the Christian faith. Uh, this is when people redefine the Trinity uh, redefine the person of Christ, don't believe in the full humanity, full deity of Jesus, deny the inspiration, the authority of Scripture, uh, deny penal substitutionary atonement or the bodily resurrection, or that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. See, there, there are things that may be error, that may be mistakes in, in, in teaching biblically. For example, I think... Um, uh, and, and we'll talk about primary and secondary doctrine later. But, um, you know, when someone teaches that baptism is, uh, that you can be baptized by sprinkling, that's an error. But it's not really a heresy because it's not a matter of salvation in and of I I itself. But if someone teaches that there's salvation uh, other than through Jesus Christ exclusively, that's heresy because believing that will bring damnation to that person. It will send them uh, to hell. So a, a second type of false teacher that he mentions today is the charlatan. And this is the one whose religion, whose teaching, whose ministry is about gaining money from uh, other people. Uh, Paul warned against this in 1 Timothy 6 when he spoke of people who supposed that godliness is a means of, of gain. In, in the history of the church, this goes back to the selling of indulgences in the Roman Catholic Church. And, uh, you know, one of the priests famously said, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And so that was kind of like the first televangelist in a way. You know, today it's people like, uh, you know, Creflo Dollar, Kenneth Copeland, uh, you know, Benny Hinn, Mike Murdoch, uh, you know, a host of other prosperity teachers who teach that you, uh, you know, give to get, that you sow a seed, hundredfold return, uh, those kind of things. And uh, so uh, that's the charlatan. And we'll talk about the prosperity gospel uh, later. And I mentioned Benny Hinn before. And, uh, you know, I know there's a video where, where he claims to have repented of some of that. Hopefully that's true. I think time uh, will tell. Uh, number three would be uh, the, the prophet. And Chalice describes this as saying the prophet claims to be gifted by God to speak fresh revelation outside of Scripture, new authoritative words of prediction, teaching, rebuke, or, or uh, encouragement. And, um, you know, we would say that while the Holy Spirit speaks to us individually, illuminates Scripture, uh, you know, helps us to apply the Word of God, speaks to us through Scripture, that someone claiming to give a new revelation from God, that uh, this would be unbiblical, it would be false prophecy because the canon of Scripture is closed. And, um, uh, of course, Scripture says in Revelation, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, that if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book, 
And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in uh, this book. And, uh, you know, we've seen this throughout church history. Uh, you know, preachers, people do it today. And, uh, you know, some of you may actually push back on this particular uh, subject a little bit, uh, you know, because you believe that God's speaking to you and guiding you. Once again, I believe the Holy Spirit leads us, but He, ha he does it through Scripture. If we don't stand firm on the canon of Scripture, what basis do we have to really uh, refute, uh, say, Catholics who, that have added it to uh, the canon of Scripture, particularly like uh, you know Mormons, who, as we'll see later in this study, have four sources of authority, uh, you know, and put the like the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Book of Mormon, on the same level as Scripture. We have to believe that the canon is completed and that the ministry of the Holy Spirit today is illumination, is guidance, but He's not giving you revelation. He did that in Scripture. Four, uh, the, the abuser. And this is not a new thing. Uh, it's being exposed more in the church today, which is a good thing. Uh, at times this exposure has had to come from outside the church, which is a bad thing. But... Um, Challies describes the abuser as one who uses his position of leadership to take advantage of other people. Usually he takes advantage of them to feed his sexual lust, though he may also uh, desire power. And Peter and Jude both uh, refer uh, to this. And this is a disqualifying sin for ministry. Uh, you know, it, it is a false prophet, a false teacher. This is more than doctrinal. Being a false teacher, a false prophet can also relate to our actions, not just what we say we uh, believe. And, and so, and, you know, if there's a leader in the church who, uh, you know, is a pedophile, should be arrested, removed. But even, you know, if a leader in the church, uh, you know, if a pastor commits adultery, there's no place for him uh, in, 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 at least in the pastoral ministry, more be restored to the Lord, be restored to some form uh, of, of ministry. Uh, you know, when a pastor has an affair with a church member, even though it's, quote, consensual in the sense of being not rape, it's still not equal. That is an abuse of power, and uh, that it's an abusive kind of action. And this has to be dealt with uh, within the church. We have to stand up for victims. We have to help people through this and we have to deal with this sin. Uh, Chalice also speaks of the divider. This is one who uses false doctrine uh, to disrupt or destroy a church. Oftentimes it's over uh, secondary type of, uh, of doctrine. And so, uh, you know, we're to stand for the truth. But, um, you know, we're not to use truth or especially false teaching, you know, to, to wedge between people. Uh, we should try to guard the unity of the church as much as possible. Six is the tickler. And this is where, you know, where Paul referred to, uh, you know, tickling people's ears, people having itching ears and, you know, just wanting to hear what they want to hear. And uh, This is basically the person who, you know, just preaches part of the truth uh, who preaches maybe the positive side uh, of Christianity, you know, a feel-good kind of gospel, grace without repentance, those kind of things, you know, the prosperity gospel that you can have what you want. Uh, you know, the leading proponent of this today would certainly be Joel Osteen, although he's not the only and he's not the first. Uh, but, you know, Joel Osteen certainly says things that are biblically incorrect, but a lot of the issue with his teaching is what he does not say. So, an ear tickler. And finally is the, the speculator. And this is one, one where people basically are adding to Scripture. They're looking, you know, for novel new teachings, uh, sometimes claiming personal revelation. Um, you know, a, a common uh, expression of this is, you know, end time stuff. People adding to what's actually in the Bible. There was this Bible codes thing uh, a, a few years ago. But, but it's people who basically go beyond uh, scripture. So I'd encourage you to be on the lookout, be aware 
of these different types of false teachers. Now, the last thing uh, we'll cover in, in, in this session and then uh, you know, give you some time in your group uh, to work through this, go through the discussion questions. Uh, I want to spend the last few minutes talking about how to respond uh, to false teachers. Now, if we go back to what I talked about earlier in uh, Acts chapter 20, uh, remember there's false teachers who arise from within the church, there's false teachers who come from outside the church. And so they both have to be dealt with, but they are, biblically are dealt with in different ways. And, and we need to understand this distinction. So the way to deal with false teachers inside the church is through the practice of church discipline. Shepherds have to protect the sheep from the wolves. Uh, Romans 16, 17, and 18 says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For those who, uh, who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So avoid them is the language of church discipline. There's other examples of this in the New Testament. So that would mean that uh, someone who's teaching false doctrine, uh, being divisive through that, within true life, if that were to happen, that's something that the elders need to deal with, that uh, you know, we need to remove this person from a teaching position, that we would need to instruct them, that we would uh, you know, need to teach them, try to bring them to a place of repentance. If not, at some point, they need to be removed from the fellowship of the church. Now, um, what if you encounter false teaching at True Life or uh, in your church? How should that be handled? And so, uh, I'm not saying go on a heresy hunt, but we should be discerning. You should have your Bible with you at church and check out what's being taught. Same thing in small group. If, if something were ever preached at True Life that you felt like were biblically, was biblically incorrect, you should privately approach um, you know, the preacher and have a conversation with him about that and ask him to clarify and, and discuss it with him. If um, you don't feel like you get a satisfactory answer, it's something you should go to the elders about. You shouldn't be talking to other people about it at that point. You should go to the preacher and then the elders and let it be dealt with from there. Same thing in a small group. If, if something you felt like was biblically untrue that was taught in, in small group happened, talk to the leader privately. If you don't feel like it's resolved, then uh, go to one of the elders. Uh, but like I say, you should give the benefit of the doubt and make sure that it's clear biblical error. Now, we also need to talk about, though, what about false teachers outside the church? You know, in pseudo-Christian religions or, or clearly, um, you know, just unbiblical, non-Christian religions. So to, the way to deal with false teachers outside the church is through refusing to support them and by sharing the gospel with them. 2 John, 7, 11, uh, 2 John 7, 7 through 11 says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not, and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. And I believe that phrase, do not uh, receive him into your house, nor greet him, refers to uh, you know, supporting them in some way, helping them in their ministry. It doesn't mean you can't invite them into your house and have a conversation with them for you to try to share the gospel with them. So, uh, let's just say something like this happens. And, I mean, there's different ways this could manifest itself. But let's just say that a couple of Mormon missionaries show up at your door or a couple of Jehovah's Witness missionaries show up at your door. That happened uh, at, at our house recently. So, you know, what should you do? How should you handle that? Well, I would hope that you're going to be equipped enough to be able to share Christ with them because it is an opportunity. Uh, we certainly shouldn't be rude to them. That's not uh, Christ-like or a good witness uh, for Jesus. But 
you know, what kind of strategy should we employ? Well, and, and, and this is uh, in your notes. There's a long quote uh, from Dr. Danny Aiken. I'm going to suggest his methodology. So he suggests the, the following strategy. First of all, be kind and gracious. You know, show them the love of Christ. Remember that Jesus died for these people. They need him. Second, if it's convenient and, and, and appropriate, and, um, you know, you, if you're a male home alone, you might not want to have just two women come in. If you're a woman home alone, probably uh, shouldn't invite strangers to, to enter. But if it's appropriate, invite them in for a, a brief visit or invite them back at a better time. Third, I think this is important, he suggests establishing clear and fair ground rules for the visit, where he suggests giving them 15 minutes to share what they want to share without interruption and that they would have to agree to give you 15 minutes to share uh, without interruption. Where basically, you share your testimony, you share uh, about Jesus. When you finish, uh, you know, lead in prayer, asking for God to show uh, you all the truth, and then thank them for coming, invite them to come back at, uh, at another time. And uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom in his suggestion. You can read it in detail in your notes. Um, I would kind of just add to this a little bit. If there was a follow-up visit, another opportunity uh, to talk to them, some of the things you should remember is, you know, first of all, to make sure you know what you believe and why if you're going to dialogue with them. And hopefully, and then this is part of the purpose of this, try to prepare you to do that. Remember the First Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense for everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So also speak the truth in love and remember the goal is to win a soul, not an argument. Uh, try to make it a conversation by asking questions and, and, and listening. Ask open-ended questions that gets them outside of their canned uh, presentation. Make them think. Um, make sure that everyone in the conversation defines their terms because in pseudo-Christian religions, uh, often they will use biblical terms in unbiblical ways so you can talk past each other. And you may have to press them a little bit to do this. And in some cases, uh, they may get angry. Um, reason with them uh, from the scriptures. That's what Paul did. Make them argue against the Bible. Make sure that any scripture that is shared is looked at in its immediate and overall uh, biblical uh, context. Ultimately, focus on Jesus, the gospel, and the, and the major doctrines of scripture. Try to point them to Christ. Uh, you know, don't try to win an, an argument. So, Hopefully you'll see that we are warned against false teachings in Scripture, that we need to be equipped to recognize them, but we also need to be equipped uh, to be witnesses to those who are caught up in false teachings and uh, you know, stand outside of Christ and are, and are missing out on the gospel. So uh, now in, in your group, you've got the discussion questions and uh, you know, work through those questions, work through this together as a group.